Patrick clicked in to College Volleyball Weekly on Viral Volley Media. Now here's your host, Rob on Mike. All right, good day, everyone. We've got an after dark episode of College Volleyball Weekly. I think we can call this episode 225 or 16 point. Uh, two because he had point <laughs> one earlier in the day with the other three coaches but uh, as i said we did not let jay go he just had had important eiva business but he didn't get to see the dynamic between the two coaches who are playing each other in the opening round this week and that was of course theo and brad csun versus uc san diego and unfortunately dan shaved his beard his season's done and He's uh he could have been on the after dark episode also with some of the language he used to describe the start of his early vacation, but still love him and he's still gonna be jumping on. But Jay Hosick of George Mason and uh as he always starts, elephant in the room, but there's only one other elephant right now. So and I already shared my bit this morning. <laughs> but I uh, talked about we tried to do the EIVA in your absence, but you could give us a better picture of what happened and what's gonna happen. Yeah, well, I'm just going to take a sip of my frosty adult beverage here real quick to to wet my whistles, so to speak. <laughs> but the elephant in the room, you know, uh, I'll talk about my match first. Um, you know, we went up to Penn State. We still controlled our own destiny. Um, and we felt pretty good. We had some good matches under our belt in the prior weeks. And, you know, we go in the first night and we end up going up 2-1 uh, on Penn State at home. And you know, unfortunately, ran into a, a juggernaut named John Kerr. And John Kerr had one hell of a weekend overall. I think he hit almost 500 or just over 500 for the weekend. Um, and that's tough. You know, when, when you when you face somebody who, you know, has that ability to put the ball down on any given moment or at least put you in some trouble, um, you know, he did a really, really nice job. So we ended up losing uh, the first night in 5, 15, 13, and the 5th. Uh, we felt good about our performance uh, going into the next night. Unfortunately, my guys kind of had lost a little of that momentum. They really wanted to host the IBAs, uh, and unfortunately, just they didn't have anything left in the tank for that night. So uh, we lost in four uh, on the second night, but secured the second seed uh, in the tournament, which is good. So we get a first round bye. Uh, but that's because Charleston comes out of nowhere and beats Princeton in five uh, on their, on the Friday night. And uh, so we got a second C with a little bit of a gift, a little help there from Luke and his boys at Charleston. Uh, you know, Delancey had a good night and Nissen had a good night and, you know, they're just, they're just rolling along right now. So the EIV tournament showing up, showing up to be pretty fun uh, to watch right now. Cause you got some good matches coming up, but yeah, you know, we, we felt okay about the weekend, but, you know, the reality is it's all about what happens at this point moving forward. It's one and done territory for everybody. And the EIBA has got, uh, you know, a couple of hot matches on Wednesday. And then Thursday night, we'll get after it again. So we're excited about what's coming up. Well, I mean, you got to look at the matchups here. You have basically teams taking on each other uh, three times in a row after this last weekend, especially between the uh, Princeton-Charleston matchup and NGIT-Harvard matchup. They see each other for two and they, they meet again on Wednesday. Did they just hang out at each other's place? Yeah, I mean, I, that's basically it. You know, we, we had our EAVA conference call this morning, or at least one of them. And, you know, Luke's trying to give anything he can for, for Sam to have to think about during the call. And, you know, it's all in good fun. But, yeah, those teams are playing three times in, what, five days? And that's, uh, you know, it's pretty tough to do. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, that the, the Wednesday night matches are going to be really fun to watch. I mean, Harvard and JIT – they're, they're two teams that are just scrapping and fighting for every little chance to get. But Charleston's a team that if you're not paying attention to them, they can sting you a little bit. And Princeton, they've got some good players. Obviously, the pieces of O'Many and Harrington, and they got a good setter in Wedbush. It's a really dangerous team. But Charleston's on a mission right now. And I, I'm I'm not sure that, that Charleston is going to pull it out, but I would not be surprised. Uh, and obviously, we're going to be watching that match with beta breath to kind of see which one we're going to face. But you know, those are those are two teams that right now I think anybody could pick uh, either one of them and argue for that one to win. Well, when they had a, a healthy team on the court, you know, that was uh, Rash Jesse Delancey and Garrett Schnitker at the same time. They were doing some really good things early on in the season. 
So unfortunately, injuries occurred in the preseason, literally right before conference play. So we never got a sense of how good they really could be. Yeah, they got they got slowed down a little bit by the injury bug. But I think everybody right now across the board is healthy. Uh, it's just a matter of are they back in rhythm? Are they going to be ready to go when they play together, when it counts, when it when it's all on the line? Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it, we're like the Miva right now. It's it's anybody's game. Uh, obviously, Penn State's in the driver's seat, but you know they they've shown that you know if you make a couple of moves here and there, if you slow a couple of balls down, you can put a little pressure on them. You know, you could steal one or two of those games away, and the next thing you know, the 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 things get a little bit tight. But you know, I think until Penn State loses, I think they're going to be in the driver's seat, and I think everybody else is kind of looking up at them, going, you know, it, it when's it our turn, and 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 can we perform when the lights are on? Yeah, well, you obviously have been touching on all the EIVA competition, but. What other uh, conferences were you watching over the weekend? I imagine you were just volleying out. <laughs> I was. I, I had uh, no shortage of my phone, my iPad, and my TV going at all my at all moments when I could. I'll tell you, there's a couple of matches that 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 caught my eye. One uh, is uh, the Hawaii uh, San Diego match, in which San Diego on Senior Night pulled out a 3-0 win over Hawaii. Now, I'm not sure what was on the line. Um, you know, Hawaii could have fallen into the trap that we kind of fell in, which is it didn't really mean much. We were going to be seated what we were seated regardless. They kind of were ready to go home and, and get ready to play in the Big West tournament. But San Diego played with a little bit of moxie and good for them on senior night to go with a 3-0 win. That's kind of fun. And then Lindenwood pulling one out over PFW. Now, we've been talking about the Miva all year long. And <laughs> anybody can beat anybody on any, any given night. But if you remember... There was a moment there where I said there were some giant killers. One of them was Northridge, and they had, you know, they had beaten Hawaii. Uh, they had beaten, uh, I forgot who else they beat, they beat Irvine. And there was a couple of matches where they were close early in the year. And the other one was Lindenwood. And what does Lindenwood do? They go out and they beat PFW, who is on a little bit of a hot streak. And uh, and good for Joe and those guys. You know, they're, they're a a relatively new program. They've been around for what, five years or so, maybe six years, but they're brand new D one. And now they're starting to make a name for themselves. And, you know, they're coming into this tournament. Who do they have coming up here? They have, um, they've got ball state and that could be an upset. I could be calling that one as an upset. Cause I think Lindenwood's got something to prove this year. Um, ball state's good. Don't get me wrong. But Lindenwood has got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And so I kind of like that match. Uh, I'm going to be watching that one pretty, uh, pretty, pretty tightly because I'm I'm interested to see what Lindenwood could do. Well, I'm looking at the uh, box score from uh, the match against PFW and Lindenwood had three attackers with a total of five total attackers hit 540 as a team, three double digit kills. That's AJ Lewis, who we've mentioned his name quite a bit, Clay Weeder and Ian Schuler. So, uh, and they both 10, 10, and 14 kills, respectively, hitting well over 400. Well, is it Weeder the, the middle blocker? I believe so, yes. I believe so. That kid's a fiery competitor. If you ever watch him on TV, the kid has got an absolute uh, energy pack on his back, uh, and the team feeds off that energy like crazy. He gets on the court, he's bouncing around, he's pointing guys out, and he's fi high-fiving people. He's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, you know, and, and AJ, obviously, we have been talking about him a little bit this year. He's really good. Um, and I think there's probably a few teams that overlooked him a little bit when they were recruiting him and are probably thinking back, eh, we maybe should have picked that kid up. But, yeah, that, that they're a team right now that I, I do not want to face. And Ball State, you know, they've got, uh, you know, the, everyone's expecting them to kind of roll through this maybe a little bit. And I wouldn't be so surprised. I think Lindenwood – and I think Donan and his staff are not thinking they're going to roll over them. I think they're definitely watching them and looking at them uh, intensely and saying, what do we got to do to slow this team down? Because they are on a roll right now. Yeah. Well, I mentioned earlier in our uh, the other episode, the pre-After Dark ep episode, that you know one of the leading setters in the nation is Connor Sheehan at 11.22 assists per set. And I haven't seen him play in person, but I'm going to guess he's doing some really good things because he is getting – attackers and double digit kills and hitting well over at Nick's just a great mark. Well, he's, he's kind of like Aiden Knipe. He's kind of like Nick Slide. He could sling the rock from anywhere on the court. 
and it's in a good spot. I mean, if you're a hitter and you're 30 feet away from this guy and he slings one back to you, it's not like it's 15 feet off the net and it's low and there's nothing you could do with it. It's in a good spot in a good tempo and, and you can go up and hit that ball with some authority. That's fun to watch. And that kid is definitely one of the reasons why Lindenwood is a team we're talking about right now. Well, one of the other teams in the uh, MEVA conference championship or tournament, whatever you want to call it, because I, I get hit for the branding of this all the time, but uh, <laughs> the MEVA player of the year. I like that PVB or Parker Van Buren has been the last two, three years has been such a monster. And this year he gets the big award. Yeah, and, and kudos to him. He's obviously, you know, like, uh, someone that has has worked hard to master his craft. I remember seeing him early in the year, and I and I was talking to their coach afterwards. We were having a couple of adult beverages, just kind of chatting about things. And and you know, I I know Hawks already knows this stuff, but I looked at Hawks and I go, man, if that kid ever learns how to hit line with authority and consistency, he's gonna be a kid making a lot of money at the next level. He's what six nine, jumps a ton, he's got a good arm. Uh, but he was a little limited in his range, I think, earlier in the part of this year. But he seems to have found a little bit of a line shot that is making, you know, a little bit of noise. It's starting to create some headaches. Loyola, you know, is in a position with Ohio State. I think they won in five and then lost in three, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in Ohio State, in the last few weeks, has had a couple of scares. And, and maybe they're not fully 100%. Maybe Pester's maybe 90%. Maybe he's 100 I don't know. But... I don't know. I, I, I got Loyola in the final. Uh, I think I'm, I'm not going to, I'll make the call now. I got Loyola and Lindenwood in the final. That's who I got in the final to me, but yeah, I just think, I think Lindenwood's on a tear. And if you Don't get Lindenwood, yeah, yeah. Jay, not <laughs> <laughs> right now. The, the, the question is who's going to win it all. And, yeah. and I'll be honest with you. I think Loyola has got what it takes to win it all this year. They, they just seem to be the team that's the most consistent. I know they've had a couple of down matches here and there. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're not head and shoulders above everybody else. But I think they're they're getting hot at the right time. Obviously, Van Buren's got a little bit of momentum right now. Um, you know, Man Gun's got some really good, uh, some good distribution going on. Uh, they got that freshman of the year who's doing good things on the outside. I, they're just solid. And Loyola uh, is well coached. Uh, and I think... They're the team that I have winning the Miva this year at this point. That's yeah. my goal. What's well, uh Daniel Fabakovich as you're referring to as the uh, freshman outside. And I haven't seen the actual whole uh, all conference listing for the Miva yet, but I'm sure he's got some kind of war, definitely all freshman team, if not freshman of the year. Um, but this is the thing Loyola was going with two other setters because man gun was not available in the beginning of the, the uh, uh, season right however since man gun's been in i believe they're like seven and two or 11 and two yeah it's a large number <laughs> and i mean he's he's the guy right he's been around the longest he knows what it feels like he's been in you know in, in matches that matter he, he he's got the nerves that he can kind of calm down for everybody around him he's the guy uh and i think i think he's going to lead that team to a championship and i think you're going to see hawks and his boys in long beach come in uh late april early may yep yeah. Um, any other uh, matches in the other conferences you want to cherry pick on? Well, I, let's talk about Irvine Long Beach. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was not surprised that Irvine won at home. Uh, it was, it was a pretty big match, uh, but I was surprised that they went down so fast at Long Beach. Uh, and, and listen, senior night means something, right? There's a little extra oomph in your step. There's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, chest thumping, you're, you're feeling your, your oats, so to speak. Uh, it was a little bit faster than I expected, but I have those two playing in the finals in the big West. And I don't know who I'm going to pick yet, but I have an idea. Should we get to that point? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the uh, night one, as uh, I was explaining earlier, you know, Irvine came out everything was working all three of their pins were going ballistic uh service line was i think the uh the differentiating factor there because on night two irvine's serving was horrendous i don't want to take anything away from what long beach is doing but sotir shapani's 
I mean, there was no such thing as a broken play for Long Beach State. He was making sure you just popped it high. He was swinging at everything. If that was like 30 feet off the end line, he was still going to swing at the ball and he's still yeah. getting points off it. <laughs> that's that's Long Beach's moniker. They've been that way this whole year. You know, Aiden and I, I listen, Mason Briggs, one of the best liberos in the country, you're not the best. Um, and keeps him in system an awful lot. But, you know, the other two guys are occasionally they're, they're bringing him off the net or maybe it's off a dig. Long Beach likes being out of system. They're, they're not running super fast. And so for them all year long, they've been training on this out of system swinging and you're right. Japonis, the kid could be 30 feet off the net and he's ripping it like it's a jump serve. And if you're not paying attention to it, meaning you're pulling off the net thinking he's going to just roll it in and he's just going to go transition it. He's putting some heat behind that thing. And Varga, Man, that kid is good. Uh, and you know, he's he's got people around him that can play at a high level. Um, you know, I Long Beach is a team that I think if if they can if they get to the point where it's Irvine and Long Beach, which is who I think is going to be in the final of that conf of that conference. If Heno can get a little support, obviously Darcy's got to be able to do his thing. Can Flexen step up? He's been a little bit hit or miss. Um, you know, kind of, you know, in a couple of points and doing really well, and then kind of goes away for a little bit. I'll tell you who my my unsung hero of that team is, Gregorov. That kid's good. <laughs> He's only what six five, six six, six four, six four. Even six, better, four Russian from Walla Creek. Even better, and he's from NorCal. That's even better. The kid <laughs> is really good, and it does not matter where his setter gets in the ball. He just finds a way to get good wood on it, and that's. If he could get a couple of kills and take some pressure off the pins, because everybody knows it's going to Heno, right? We all we all know, hey, you get into trouble, go to Heno. We're in system, go to Heno. Uh, <laughs> got a second contact coming and Heno's underneath it, he's going to swing at it anyways. It's all going to Heno. But if he can take a couple of points, some points of pressure off of him and swing at a couple that nobody's paying attention to him for, because they're all looking at Heno, that could be the difference maker. Uh, yeah. And I like I like what Urban can do because they can just play ball. Um, and they're kind of like backyard, you know, middle of the winter football with your boys. You know, you, you get into a huddle and you go, hey, go to the trash can and make a quick right and I'll throw you there. Or, <laughs> hey, do a button hook and then wave high to my mom and I'll throw you the ball. Like, it's just mud ball, right? But it's <laughs> so fun to watch because just guys that know how to play. And they have one guy that can get you out of trouble if they need it. But that's uh, – I. I I'm not going to lie to you. I think Long Beach is going to get out of that conference as the champion, but I would not be surprised to see Irvine get the, the at-large. Wow. You know, one other thing I wanted to, well, there may be two, but uh, the serve that uh, Shapani's delivered on Saturday night, I hadn't seen before. Maybe I just wasn't watching closely enough, but it looks like he's going up for a, a hybrid and he ends up cracking a ball with some massive pace and spin, like a, his approach and toss, no rotation. And he like pulls full, full swing on it. You're going to see that kid make a lot of money in the next couple of years <laughs> professionally. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how good Cypress's national team is, but he's going to make a lot of money playing pro uh, and he's going to play for a while. He's one of those guys that he's, he's looks like he's pretty durable, you know, like he's going to last for a while. He can be that guy that lasts till he's 40 and is just a crowd favorite because he's fiery and he's a competitor and he does a lot of things really, really well. We'll see what he does. Yeah. Uh, how about any, uh, MPSF? Let's get your thoughts on MPSF. You know, I, I'm looking at the bracket right now and I, and I see Stanford Pepperdine. That's kind of a match. I think Stanford should win. Pepperdine has been a little bit up and down this year. Um, you know, their, their lineups haven't changed a ton in recent weeks, but it seemed early in the year, they were kind of going through it a little bit. I just think Stanford's got too many old guys on that team that are tired of, you know, kind of be an also rans and, and kind of want to leave their mark. So I, I've got Stanford uh, beating that match. BYU USC. Um, that's a contest that I think can go either direction. I've actually got BYU winning that. Um, I just think they've got a few more pieces. USC has got Klein obviously, uh, and they've got the freshmen, uh, but they, they're just, there's just too many pieces of BYU, I think, that are too solid. Uh, Grand Canyon, I think, is going to well, sweep. Let's hold there because one of the things that – so there are a couple factors involved in that matchup. One, BYU has been on a week break. And two, USC is hosting the tournament. <laughs> 
So I don't <laughs> care. I don't <laughs> care. I'm calling BYU. I think the extra right, week off is actually going to help them. Um, I think obviously being at home helps USC, but I think BYU right. is going to pull that one out. Uh, and that couldn't, that might not be so good for USC in terms of putting butts in the seats, but um, I think BYU is going to pull that out. I think Grand Canyon is going to sweep Concordia. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, and then I just think for me, I think the finals of that conference are going to be UCLA and Grand Canyon. If it's Grand Canyon and UCLA and it's close, I think Grand Canyon might get the other at large. If Grand Canyon pulls it out, UCLA for sure gets the at large. There's no question in my mind. Um, But I think the finals at uh, in the big West, the last two teams, Irvine Long Beach will be one that gets an odd and one that gets an at large. And I think if it's UCLA and Grand Canyon and UCLA wins it, I think Grand Canyon gets the other at large. I think Hawaii might be out at that moment. Now, if Hawaii can get by Irvine and get to the finals, maybe <laughs> Hawaii gets the non. Maybe I don't know. I haven't done all we the. We're hosting Columbia. Jay, and that's one yeah. place. <laughs> I know. I haven't. I haven't gone through all the criteria, so don't send me any hate mail, anybody. I don't want to get all crazy, <laughs> but I have. But I seem to think that if Hawaii can make it to the finals, something tells me they might get that at large. Uh, but we'll see, because uh, I think they split with Irvine, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, that's right. One of the matches that they have against. Well, they had a non-conference also. Uh, yeah, so. I, I don't know why they do that. I mean, I, I get it, but I don't get it. If that makes any sense, you play three team, three a team three times in the season before the playoffs. I'm not so sure that really does anything for anybody, especially when one of them doesn't really mean anything. But regardless, you know, they can do what they want. It's their choice. But that's <laughs> why I think I think I think UCLA is just head and shoulders above everybody in the MPSF right now. They're they're too solid. They're too deep. Um, you know, Rowan is, is dishing the rock at such a fantastic pace right now. He's got so many pins and so many middles that he can go with at any given moment. It's just ridiculous. The depth that they have right now, but you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I think UCLA is going to, I think they're going to pull that one out pretty easily. There we go. Final two conferences, conference Carolinas and SIAC. Um, I think we discussed how, uh, right now the two favorites, are of course Fort Valley State and uh, Edward Waters College. However, Edward Waters isn't eligible to participate in the NCAA tournament this year. They have to wait one year, so that means the runner-up, or assuming <clears throat> anyone but Edward Waters can go in. But Fort Valley is the hardcore favorite. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I think it's hard to go against what Fort Valley has done this year. Listen, I I got to give them a little love. Obviously, Larry's uh, a great friend and a colleague. He's also got one of my graduated seniors, Che Cooper, is one of their outside hitters. I know they have Isaiah Fed on the outside as well. That's a that's a pretty big duo of outside hitters for that conference. Um, I, I have Fort Valley State winning it. I, I think they're going to see Edward Waters in the final. Um, but I think Fort Valley State is just too complete a team, and I think they're going to pull it out. And you know what? Hooray, men's volleyball. Good for you. Fort Valley State, should you go on and represent your conference? Because it's about time we get some new blood in that place. Yep. And Conference Carolinas. Uh, Belmont Abbey ended up winning the conference. So they got the one seed, North Greenville, too. Um, but as you all learned from last year, a little team called King ran their way into Fairfax, Virginia, which is awesome to watch and work with you, Jay. <laughs> yeah, no, no. They, they, they had a little outside hitter that jumped a ton and had a great arm, but you know, I, I've got Belmont Abbey getting to the finals. Mount Olive, I think, is going to be Barton. Mount Olive's good. They're sneaky good. Uh, we played them earlier this year, and, you know, there were some moments that I'm looking at that team going, man, how are they just not dominating that conference right now? But I didn't get a chance to see Belmont Abbey play live, so I, I can't tell. Mm-hmm. But I think Belmont Abbey is going to beat Mount Olive in the second round. Uh, you know, Erskine, I think, is going to beat King this year. I think Erskine's a little bit more complete. North Greenville is going to be too much for them, however. It's going to be North Greenville – and Belmont Abbey, and I got Belmont Abbey running the table. I think they're a team of destiny. Derek's done some really nice things with that program. They, in the last few years, they had a, a little bit of a downturn there where they were kind of an all ram but he's turned that team around. He's getting some good support. I got Belmont Abbey representing the Conference Carolinas and, uh, and doing some damage. And I think they're going to get the seven seed would be my guess. I think the SIAC will be yeah. the eight seed. Um, and so if that's the case, then number two is going to be probably, 
Whoever wins the Big West would be my guest. You think UCLA get the number one seed? I think UCLA get the one seed, don't you? Or, uh, Long Beach. Eh, it could be UCLA they play. Yeah, Long Beach is probably going to get <laughs> well, the one seed. UCLA get the two seed. Re- recording when we are right now, we have the benefit of looking at the today's ABCA poll, which is released at noon Pacific. And there's a new number one, well, a re-new number one, UCLA back on top. Long Beach State at two, and Irvine moves into three with Grand Canyon four, Hawaii at five. Yeah, I think the I think the loss against Irvine on Friday night hurt them, which is why Long Beach moved down to number two. But you know, at, at UCLA if if they are the one seed and Long Beach is the two, Long Beach against uh, against Belmont Abbey that's 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 a tough that's a tough one to pull. I think Belmont Abbey's you know a well respected team, and congratulations to them should they make it to that far and. But, uh, you know, you're, you're playing against the top two, three teams in the country. It's going to be pretty tough for a team of that size and stature to be able to keep up with them. But you never know. You could see him yeah. do some things like King did last year against Ohio State. That was They almost pulled one out. And that's why I call it the March to Mayhem. <laughs> I love it. I love that title, by the way. Mar- March to Mayhem is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> well, it's funny because I was happening perusing Volley Talk for some uh, just a discussion. And one of the things that came up was you centered, believe it or not. Shocker. <laughs> Whoa. Because uh, George Mason had won 11 straight versus not so great teams before losing competitively to Penn State. Did they figure anything out for the EIVA tournament to get over the hump against PSU? Should they play again? I guess you don't want to show your cards, Jay, but I just thought it was interesting that they recognized that your team was battling in that that five or this last weekend. Well, I I appreciate the backhand compliment. Not so not so great teams. I don't know how Harvard feels about that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how NGIT feels about that. Beat Irvine. How, I don't know how St. Francis feels about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> we're not that bad of a team. We beat some big teams this year. We beat Northridge. We beat Irvine. You know, we, we might be okay. Uh, we beat Princeton. But you know what? Regardless, um, you know, I'm 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 happy to be in the conversation. Here's what I know: our conference. Uh, has got probably four or five teams that are legitimately um, good programs, right? They can they can go and do some damage. The challenge is it's hosted at Penn State because they win the regular season, which is, you know, it's fine. So you, you earn that right. When you sleep in your own bed, when you're used to the surroundings, when you're playing in front of your own fans, that means something. And you know, that's why Hawaii has a, a massive advantage hosting the Big West every year. Um, but the, the problem is, is that, you know, Penn state is, uh, not the juggernaut, if you will, that it was in the last two or three years, they were a, you know, a top five, top 10 program, depending on the time of year for a reason, those years this year, they they've had some good matches and they've had some not good matches, but they're not, they're not across the board, the same level as they've been. So I think everybody's looking at it going, well, We're going to have to slow one or two of those guys down a little bit. You're not going to stop them. (laughs) But if you can get hot from behind the service line, if you could, you know, get a couple of points in transition, if you can put a little pressure on them, you know, they're, they're, they're they're not going to run away with 10 points or so like they did in the last couple of years when they can just, you know, hit a couple of guys up. I think, I think if I look at that conference uh, or our conference and I see the Harvard NGIT match, I think NGIT is going to win that semifinal or quarterfinal match. I, th- I think NGIT mm-hmm. has figured some things out in recent weeks. Um, and I think the Princeton Charleston one is probably the biggest question mark because Charleston's got a chip on the shoulder. You know, they remind me a little bit of Northridge. They remind me a little bit of teams back in the day that they walked into a gym and they maybe not the tallest, maybe not the strongest, but they were a team that was going to ball out and make you have to finish. I wouldn't be surprised to see Charleston win that match against Princeton. But I, I think Princeton's going to win it. Um, and, and it might be, it might go five at that point. I think Penn state's going to beat NJIT without question. If we end up playing against Princeton again, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw my name in the hat and go, I, I like our chances. I like us getting to the finals. I think we're doing some good things. I know last Friday was, it was a good match for us that Saturday was a little bit uninspired, but um, you know, Saturday again, if we get the chance to see Penn state, you know, we're going to come in with uh, with a couple of guns firing and hopefully it's at the right times and the right moments. Is every round at the tournament at Happy Valley? Yep. Yep. It's at the host team who wins uh, the regular season. And I think this is the, geez, it's been a while 
since Penn State has had to wait to the last weekend to know if they were hosting or not. I think it's been a little bit up in the air, maybe in in recent years. Maybe maybe last year it wasn't so much, but um, you know, and it's been a while. It's been a while since they've had to wait that long to know that they were going to host the tournament. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Jay, and, and please do feel free to choose more than one. But you're a who's your a baller of the week, player of the week, or players ballers? I mean, there's a lot of good performances, and obviously with crunch time here going into the tournaments, you saw yeah. some people really step it up. Yeah, I I, I got to give some love to Varga. I think he uh, I think he's really stepping up at the right moments for Long Beach State. Uh, I got to give a little love to Sheehan at Lindenwood. I think he's just he's just doing so many nice things uh, for that program and, and giving his hitters a chance to stay in rhythm. I got to give a, a little bit of love, unfortunately, to John Kerr at Penn State. The kid, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we did not have an answer for him in this year. There's, it's been the story of trying to block opposites for us. We've had a little bit of a tough time, but um, you know, he's just solid all the way around. And uh, and I. I hate saying it, but I got to give the kid some love. He deserves it. He played really, really well. So those are some players that I've been paying attention to this past week. And then I think, um, you know, are, are ones to watch moving forward. Yeah. Well, the question I kind of ju- uh, threw on the guys this morning without any warning was at large discussion. What do you think that's going to look like? <clears throat> yeah. I, I, again, I don't, I don't have the, the criteria. There's seven criteria, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, obviously there's head to head and there's road matches versus ranked teams or whatever matches versus ranked teams, KPIs involved, strength of schedule. Like there's just, there's a bunch of things, right? Yep. I, I, I don't think anybody outside of the big West in the MPSF are going to get that at large. I just don't, uh, I don't think, um, you know, there, there's some teams that are maybe in the conversation because they might have one or two of the criteria, but I don't think seriously, Anybody outside of those two conferences gets the at large this year. I think uh, I think in in the Big West, the three teams that are in the conversation are Long Beach, Irvine, and Hawaii. Um, and I think it depends on how far Hawaii goes that will help their at large cause because they're going to face Irvine in the second round. I think they're going to beat Santa Barbara. Um, I don't think them losing to San Diego is any indication of them not being able to handle that moment. Um, and that match is going to be really, really a hard fought one. You know, Long Beach is going to face Northridge. I think Long Beach is going to win that one pretty handily. I, sorry, Theo. I know you're probably watching this right now, but you know, Lo- Long Beach is going to face most likely the, uh, you know, it obviously it's going to be Hawaii, UC Irvine. I think they're going to face Irvine. But you make a good point. It's at Hawaii, and Hawaii is good at home. Um, but I think the team that gets to the final is going to get that nod. And I, I think it just depends on which one it is. And I don't think if Irvine loses to Hawaii, they're going to get the at-large nod over Hawaii. And mm-hmm. if uh, if Irvine makes it, I don't think Hawaii is going to get the nod over Irvine. I just don't think... Mm-hmm. I don't think that the, the, the rankings are the, not the rankings, but the, the criteria fit either one of those models. Now, should Long Beach lose in the finals? They're getting a call. Not even a question. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I've got th- the criteria up in uh well, with exception of the new criteria this year, KPI is going to be in that mix. Uh, RPI strength of schedule, one loss results, head to head competition results versus non-conference opponents, home and away results results against common opponents and results against teams already qualified and other teams under consideration. And well, this is the, the question mark one is eligibility and availability availability of student athletes for the NCAA uh, championships. I hate, I hate that criterion. I hate it because it's the, it's the Florida state model, right? Florida state football went 11 and 0 won their conference championship. And because their starting quarterback wasn't healthy, who was an all-star, you know, the kid was obviously unbelievable. They did not get the nod to go to the big dance in the NCAA football championships. And you want to talk about a travesty that, that if I'm that backup quarterback, I'm looking at them going, what am I chopped liver? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I know I'm not the, the name brand that, that, that started over me most of the <laughs> year, but I also won a few games. I might know how to play that at some level, 
Um, and I and I hate that criteria, but you know, we, the fact remains. I think Hawaii's strength of schedule or RPI is fairly low, isn't it? What's that? The RPI yeah. for Hawaii? Yeah, the RPI. They're like down twenty two or something like that. Or what? What's well, that? Pull that up. <laughs> yeah, pull that up because I, I had it in front of me, and I, I remember there was one number. I was like, "Whoa, that's really low." compared to what I thought it would be. And I don't know if it's strength of schedule. I don't know if it's RPI, KPI. One of the two is like 22. <clears throat> yeah. Well, RPI Hawaii is at eight and that's as of t uh, yesterday. And Irvine so, is what at five? Irvine is at four. They moved up this four. week. Okay. UCLA has got the one Grand Canyon two Long Beach at three. Yeah. Yeah. And because Grand Canyon lost, that that helps out Hawaii a little bit right there, obviously. Um, and you got Penn State, and Ohio State, and BYU in front of Hawaii at yeah. this point. Yeah, I, I I just think, and that that can be the other topic of conversation. What if somebody else out of the EIVA wins? Does Penn State get a nod? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, crazy, huh? I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> you never know. You want to, you want to see some monkey wrenches? You just you know sit back and watch. But regardless, I think I think that's the call there. And then the the MPSF, you know, if it's it you see, I've got UCLA winning the whole thing, so I obviously they're going to get that call. Whoever they face, if it's Grand Canyon or Stanford, could, could one of those teams pull an upset? Maybe. And if they do, automatically UCLA gets the at large. There's not even a, not even a question mark. But if UCLA wins and it's against Grand Canyon in the final, does Grand Canyon get the other at large? I don't know if Big West gets two teams at large. I just don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, Vinny Lopes, if you're watching, you're the guy to ask that thing because you're the one who'll have all that criteria. But, you know, there, there's there's a lot of objective, but there's also a subjective. And now right. you throw that into the mix and that could be the 3-3 three, three tiebreaker and all of a sudden – but I don't know if Grand Canyon doesn't have everybody healthy. I think Stanford has everybody healthy. So I don't know. It might be a moot point. Well, I've got to ask you this too, though. And, and it's not a knock on the NCAA selection committee. I know they've got to rotate. We know there's one on there that's been on there for a few years. Another one who's coming back on, I think the last time she was on was probably back in the late 2000s, but she's familiar with it. Uh, another uh, NEC coaches on that, which should be all right, but the rest are rather new to the selection process. I believe there's two more, total of five. Yeah, I think there's five now. So I'm curious how the new the rookies are going to handle this whole breakdown, especially if they don't follow men's volleyball as closely as someone could. <laughs> well, I, I I think I think the criteria takes care of the majority of that, right? I don't think you know the the, the days of old when it was kind of left up to the, the deciders, the three people, right. That, that, and they claimed they were up all night making these crunching the numbers and this and that it's all computerized now. I mean, you can figure it all out in a, in a push of a button. So I think the majority of the criteria is already kind of done for them. It's, it's the, the health and availability. And there was the one other one, I can't remember what it is, but um, you know, that's, I, 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 I can't see them not rewarding the second place team in the big West and the MPSF. If the top two seeds of long beach and UCLA win, I just think it's, I, I think those are the top teams. And I, I, could you justify Hawaii? Maybe, but I bet the loss against San Diego didn't help them. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. you know, I, 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 I don't know how you would, I don't know how you could jump over somebody like that. I just, yeah. I, it doesn't make any sense. Well, some of the other X factors uh, in Hawaii is like, you know, especially with the season that Spiros Hakas was having, he's going to be there watching. And I'm telling you, that guy can lead a team even from the bench. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, he's definitely, uh, he's one of those guys that coaches talk about for decades. You know, I remember when I had this guy and this is what he used to do. And you know, the, the leaders on the team for years to come, will talk about him with reverence, right? They'll say, this is, somebody who, you know, got injured at a critical point in the season when our team really could have used him uh, and we could have, you know, maybe made a run for the title. 
uh, but he led from the bench. He led from during practice. He led during, you know, road trips, whatever the case is. Um, you know, he's, he's a special athlete and I know Hawaii really wishes he was suited up, but that we talk about the criteria being availability. If Sparrows is not healthy, obviously he's not, that could be a game changer for the committee. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> um, with that, I'm going to ask you a, uh, <laughs> another tough question that I posed to the guys this morning, but who are the ABCA national player of the year candidates in your book? Well, you take a drink of your beer. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, you know, I, I obviously talked about Spiros. I talked about Hanno. I talked about Van Buren. I talked about John Kerr. Uh, I talked about Nicholas Slight. Um, those are guys in my, uh, in Rowan. Uh, those are guys that I feel are the pinnacle of our game. And obviously I talked about Mason, but unfortunately Mason Briggs is a libero and man, if, if a libero wins player of the yeah. year, I would, I would be really surprised, but regardless, I think at this point it's getting whittled down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I still think Heno is leading the charge. I, I, I know a couple of weeks ago, everybody thinks, Oh man, Jay said that Heno is awful. I never said Heno was awful. So please, Stop the hate. Mail. I'm not really getting hate mail, but please, like, I don't leave. I don't leave you guys thinking like I think the kid's junk. Heno's ridiculous, and I know there's lots of people out there that wish he would just graduate and go play professionally next year. But uh, regardless, I think Heno's leading the charge. I think Rowan's also in that mix. Uh, he he just he has so many weapons. It, it's kind of an easier job, if you will. But he's still got to do it. Right. He's still got to throw, he's got to throw the rock at the right place at the right time. And he's got just an arsenal of weapons to choose from. Um, if I had some dark horses, I think slight, should they move on into the tournament? Should they get in and maybe win a, you know, a quarterfinal match and maybe get into the final four. And I know that, I think the, the voting takes place just prior to that. So unfortunately none of that will matter too much. Could he yeah. be a dark horse? Maybe. Well, I I thought if anyone from GCU would have mentioned Camden Gianni. I, yeah, Camden Gianni is good, but I think Camden had some off nights. I haven't seen too many off nights from Slight, and he's running that show. And I, I would give him, if I had to choose, if that was my team, and they told me who's the number one guy that your team doesn't go without, I'm telling you it's Slight. That's what I'm telling you. But <laughs> I, I think it's a long shot. I don't think that guy's going to get the call. John Kerr is legitimately one of the best opposites in the country, if not in the top three. Um, here's the scary part, Rob. He's been sitting behind Cal Fisher for four years. Four yep. years that guy has been sitting on the bench. Are you kidding <laughs> me? And this is his coming out party. Hey, everybody, I'm here for a year. Tip your waitress. I'm out. Like, it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Holy smokes. Could you imagine what this guy would have done? If he would have been able to play for three of those years, and the numbers that kid could have produced, um, you know, and, and and listen, he's kind of a no nonsense kind of kid, you know, he just kind of goes about his business. He's not a chest thumper, you know, he's mm -hmm. not going running around the court and yelling, screaming, and pointing fingers. He just he's blue collar, you know, he just goes about his business. I think I think he's a long shot compared to Heno, only because Heno's just done so many other things. This is. You know, I'd be interested to know this number, Robin. Maybe one of our our viewers can can put one of these things up. In the last, let's just say the last 30 years, how many, and go decade by decade, how many in the 90s were foreign players that won National Player of the Year? I bet the number is probably one. You've all cats? Yep. And I don't know of any others off the top of my head. Doesn't mean there wasn't any. He's just the one I remember. Then in the 2000s, or, not, or in the in the in the 2000s, you had Kosis Theocritus, and then you had, geez, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I, that's the only one I can think of. Um, then in the teens, in the in the you know the 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 2010 to 2020. All of a sudden, things changed. And I bet you the numbers 
from the 90s where we had one, maybe two. In the 2000s, we had one, maybe two. I bet from 10 to 20, we had three or four, maybe five. And all since I right, got it here, you ready? All right, here we go. Now we're Order, going. And it, it goes as far back as 91. So okay. in uh, 96 was Yuval Cuts from Hawaii. Okay. Then you have 97, Yvonne Contreras. Oh, that's I forgot great. about Yvonne. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> then there's a setter who ended up becoming an American citizen by the name of Donald Sujo in 2000. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hostos Theoritis, 2001. Yep. And 2003. <laughs> Carlos Moreno, BYU in 2004. Okay. And Paul Carroll, Aussie, Pepperdine, 2009. Yep. And uh, well, that's it. Oh, well, before changing citizenship, Gabby Garcia Fernandez, <laughs> 2020. Rado Parapunov, 21. Alex Nikolov, 23. I think. The Bulgarians, and then went to Jakob Tella in 2023. Now wait a minute. What about Ohio State? Wasn't Nicholas Scherzins? Wasn't he? Uh, oh, I skipped 2016. Sorry. Yeah. He's right. French, not Polish. <laughs> Nicholas Scherzins. You're well, right. Look at that, Jay. Look at that little yeah. tidbit there. Yeah. Well, I, I missed a few there that I should have got, but but when you as soon as you mention the name, it, it rings a bell. Here's the thing. It's becoming somewhat of a foreign game, right? And the Americans have been picking up foreign players forever. It's not something new. It's been happening since the 70s. So let's not say this is a new phenomenon. It's not. Uh, and obviously there are some teams that are foreign player heavy in terms of guys on the court. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Doesn't mean their whole team is foreign. Just means that a lot of the guys that are on the teams uh, that are on the floor at the same time are foreign. A lot of them are D2 programs. Conference Carolina is for a while there. Barton especially thriving yeah. off it, right? NJIT, a, a, a Division One team, thrives off it. There's lots of guys. Um, but this year well, could be continuing that trend. It could be three in the last four years that are foreign should Heno win. Uh, and he's got, yeah. what, two more years left? Uh, one more after this. This is year three. <laughs> so Thank you. God, that kid's <laughs> dumb. Uh, but yeah, it, it's you know I say dumb meaning good. Please, I, again, I don't want to go. Well, he's a <laughs> UC student. He should have had a good. I know he has a good GPA. Please, I don't, I'm saying <laughs> dumb like good. You know, I'm an old guy. We used to say things were bad, and we meant that bad was good. So, yeah. but anyways, no, Heno, I think is leading the charge. Uh, I think him and Rowan are probably the top two candidates at the moment. If Spiros was healthy, he's in that conversation without question. Um, and I think uh, Long Beach, I don't think they have anybody that is a standout in that capacity in my eyes. I think they have a lot of good players on the court at the same time, but I don't think anybody that stands out like Heno or Rowan does. But um, yeah, those are my top two. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because – you know, uh, Sotir Shapani, the so Cypriot, is could be in that mix, but you know, it's been spread so, uh, or it's been distributed to the rest of the Long Beach State team because you have to realize they had Clark Godbold as well, uh, Skylar Varga, uh, Varga, the Canadian, you know, so it would still potentially go forward if it was a Long Beach State player, but. <laughs> it's three guys on Long Beach that are foreign. You got Torwe, you got Varga, you got Shapanis. You know, I'm just saying it, it's uh it's yeah, I Saponis is obviously good. There's no doubt in my mind. But you know, if 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 I'm if I'm gonna pick my top two, I think it's I think it's Rowan and I think it's Hannah. Those are my two. That's crazy. You know, you brought up that stat. So for the last 10 years, half of the players of the year are foreigners. Three of the five that are the half are from Bulgaria. <laughs> ah! Well, I think you're going to see France come up here pretty quickly. They, they've got a couple of kids over the years. And listen, Canada's been a feeding program for a few programs over the years. And mm -hmm. they've had some really, I mean, Fred Winters, when he was back at Pepperdine back in the day, that was like the first Canadian that I remember that was uh -huh. really good. But Canada has been sending down some guys over the years. I mean, Stephen Hunt, when he went over to Hawaii, that kid was a, had a cannon for yeah. him. I remember him like crazy, but, you know, there, there's, 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 
great volleyball being played all around the world. And, you know, luckily we get a chance to see some of them in the States and see what they can do against the American kids. And it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, uh, with that, I think we should probably end there because we almost have a, we have a, another full episode. It was an hour this morning. We're coming up in an hour right now. <laughs> well, I, I will only end it on this because uh, we, we were at Penn State this weekend. A uh, couple of fans of the show were in the stands and uh, they had two dry erase boards. And one of them said, hey, Jay, where's the Hawaiian shirt? Or the Hawaiian shirt is a strong move. And the other one said, uh, mention us on the podcast, will you please? So I went and I took a picture with him. I'll, uh, I'll forward it to you if you want to put it up on Volley Talk. Chris and Ed, to you, you guys, you guys were fun to watch. You had some funny things to write down your, on your whiteboards. Uh, always appreciate when fans appreciate the show and show a little love. Uh, so Chris and Ed, thanks for being there. Hopefully we'll see you guys this upcoming weekend. Hey, Jay, I'll one-up you on that one. Send me the picture. I'm going to use that as the advertising for this episode. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I will I will send it to you as soon as we're done with this. Well, in our After Hours episode 225.2 or 16.2, that's Jay Hosick of uh, George Mason, heading into the EIVA tournament, now sponsored by Pacifico Beer. And, yeah, uh, send me a little well, up, Pacifico. I'm going the Matt Worley route with Celsius. This is my <laughs> choice. So know where to send it. <laughs> All right, Jay. Appreciate your time and good luck this week in Happy Valley. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to College Volleyball Weekly. Be sure to follow Rob Espero at the Rob on the Mic on Instagram and at Rob on the Mic on Twitter. <laughs>